Great dedication by Dorsa. Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borosh and this is Insane in the End Game. And today we're going to take a look at more fascinating chess from Jose Raul Capablanca. So let's have a look. So the first game between Jose Raul Capablanca and Juan Corso is interesting because it looks tedious. Many endgames he plays looks fairly tedious. However, there are some little details that you have to understand to really grasp how, long, how good he was at this endgame. So let's take a look. So the first move, d4, f5. Now, nothing really special, and what's interesting, and that's why I kind of bring out the openings as well, that even though Capablanca was very good at the endgame part, he was also a master tactician. So the next move would actually surprise you if you just think, oh, Capablanca, what a fantastic positional and endgame player. He goes e4, sacrificing a whole pawn. And in fact, this, popular, this move is popular to this day. F takes c4, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5. Now, I'm not going to delve deep into the theoretical part, because that's not really the topic. But interestingly enough, the best move here is knight c6, d5, knight d5, and bringing the knight over. However, Corzo's uh, response c6 is very logical, trying to bring the queen out as this bishop has moved away from defending that square. Bishop takes f6. E takes f6, knight takes c5, d5, knight g3. Actually, nothing special. Um, if you just look at this position, you'd think, why would this game be anyways terrible for Corzo? And it's not. It's actually decent. Very, very decent. So queen e7. And... I guess that's kind of the difference between upcoming talents and seasoned grandmasters, or world champions at that. They don't mind exchanging queens. Queen e7 is sort of saying, hey, I don't mind exchanging queens. There's no way you're going to beat me. And Capablanca goes queen e2 and says, okay, I'll, I'll try that. I'll try that. So queen e2. Queen takes e2. Should take c2. So, if you look at this position, you might be correct in saying, wait a minute, isn't Capablanca worse here? Because Capablanca does not have the bishop pair. Black does. Um, does white have a better structure? Not really. It's very symmetrical once c3 is played. Maybe the only weakness that Corzo made so far is f6. The spawn has moved from its ori original outpost from f7. So it just doesn't seem like a big deal. Bishop d6, knight f3, castles. And at the moment, um, it's very hard to believe that anything desperate will happen to black. Castles, nothing spectacular. Like all the moves that Capablanca played so far are OK, but nothing spectacular. Castles, and here actually, uh, Black makes a terrible, terrible strategic mistake, and this often happens when we have this world-class player versus an average player kind of matchup or club player kind of matchup. Here, Corzo gets very excited that he could exchange the whole board, which the excitement is understandable but there will be ramifications. He goes for bishop g4, which is not a bad move, but has the bad idea in mind. He is going to exchange off these bishops, which were the assets of the position, which actually makes me feel that black is maybe even better. Like if you go rook e8, rook here, knight d7, I do not see any reason why black shouldn't be fine. Once the knight and bishop gets out, there's just no way for white to break through, nor are these 
Bishop on e2, Knight on f3, and g3 is too inspiring. In fact, it's not inspiring at all. But Corso goes Bishop g4, saying every exchange gets me closer to a draw, but that is very, very far from the truth. h3. And h3 is kind of this cheeky move that is beloved and loved to be played. White is saying, please, be my guest. Take my knights. Please do it. And Corzo does. Takes, takes, bishop takes, knight d7. The irony of the whole thing is that this is still completely fine for black. Uh, these pawns are kind of reducing the scope of this bishop. So if anyone's kind of hoping to be better, it still should be black. Rook e1, rook e8. But the issue is, black is trying desperately to make the half a point instead of trying for more. And this is one of those things that I have to uh, recall from my own coach, saying if you want to have half a point, you should try for the full wholesale point. Otherwise, you're never going to get that half a point. King f1. And f5 feels a little bit desperate, and in fact might be the reason why black loses the game. Right now, there is not a single way of getting inside black's position. This square is blocked off. e4 is controlled as well. Possibly if black would have been more consistent, even the simple move of king f7 would and should do the job. Just bring the king in. It's an endgame, so the kings actually become stronger. And with these important squares under control, Corzo is more than likely to survive this game, maybe even push for more. Because as we might have heard, Fischer won plenty of games with a knight versus bishop in his famous U.S. Championship Tournament. So King F7 would be a better choice. Even if they exchange, that doesn't make any difference. To Bishop G4, there's Knight B6. Check is not a big deal because Black can go G6 and there are no ways of coming through. And Corzo could have A, a plan of getting the Knight to D6, maybe even eventually to E4, or Knight C4, Knight D6. In both cases, black is in no danger of losing the game. But plays f5, and this is maybe a sign of overconfidence saying, okay, I managed to exchange everything I wanted, maybe the safest moment will be if I could get the knight to e4. But I guess Corzo just didn't realize that he just gave away this e5 square, which will prove very, very important at the end. So rook takes c8, rook takes c8, rook e1. Capablanca rightfully realizes that if the knight gets to e4 with the rook still on the board, it's very difficult to make any progress. Those rooks do control the most important squares where white could enter. So it's important here for white to take on e8, take rook e1, because with this choice, he is going to give Corzo an option. Are you going to keep your rook? Well, if you do, you let my rook invade or at least get a control of the open file. Even that wouldn't necessarily be too tragic. If rook e7, there's king f8 and the rook won't stay there for long. Same deal with rook e6, king f7, and actually the rook is trapped on that square. So rook takes e1 in this sense is again a mistake. Believing that every exchange will lead to a draw, but chess is more complicated than that. Knight f6, king d2, and here comes the journey of the king. The king will walk all up, zigzag all up to e5, and from there it'll have some pressure on the f-pawn and a pressure and plan of going towards d6, c7, and b7. Now, is this that trivial? Of course not. But does this give ample winning chances for Capablanca? Yes. King d2, 
knight e4, king e3, and probably here black realized that pawn doesn't matter that much because if I can go king f4, take, and the king actually bolts towards the queen side, and white is just practically up a king, which is the most important part in the endgame. I heard that the king is considered to worth around four or four and a half points, but I never really bought into that kind of argument. A king is a king, even if it is worth four points. If you checkmate it, it still is a zero for you. So I'd say it's the strongest piece, but I'd be very careful giving it a value. So knight d6 was played. Bishop e2. If king f f4, king f7 is in just time to stop the invasion, and black might play g6, knight f7, smoking out the king. So it's not like he is already winning. Bishop e2. Move that sort of just restricts black's plans. So before Capablanca just went with the flow. He didn't really care too much about the exchanges. In fact, encouraged Corzo to go that direction. However, now he starts restricting black's pieces. So knight c4, then again, this would transpose into a lost endgame with the king just defeating this king on g8, not really participating in the action. King f7, king f4. King f6. And there is a big battlefront opening up here. One of them is the e5 square. If white manages to go through that, as we already looked at that lines, the king could come on in and white is winning. But the other question is whether black can go g5 and break through that way. Now, Capablanca, as good he good of a player he is goes for h4, stops it. Now there's no h6 because white can go h5 and fix that g pawn. And there is no reason to worry about it. If you go here, takes, takes, white manages uh, to cross the barricade and again, this is very, very difficult to hold with black. By the way, when you look at this game, or when you check it yourself, notice that it's not that Corzo couldn't save this game. It's that Capablanca posted enough problems for him that was unsurmountable during a game. So g6, g4. Again, either trying to fix these pawns on the white squares, or saying, hey, if you take, then I can go bishop g4, and eventually I might go behind your pawns. h6, g5. Forcing an exchange, also creating a potential target on g6 and f5. And this is actually what Capablanca does so well. He notices the potential targets in the position and he goes after them. And g5 is good because of that, because this pawn will be weak in the long run. King e7, g4. Quite a strong move. He's undermining the f-pawn, and once the f-pawn is gone, bishop d3 is going to be eyeing the g-pawn right there. f takes, bishop d3. A very, very strong move. Not even worrying about the g-pawn, because the king is in firm control there. He's going to take that. Knight f5, king g4, knight d4. Bishop g6. Now, this is possible to hold with black, but in a practical game, it's much, much easier to play with white because you can combine threats of trying to nurse this pawn into a lady or to go and switch over to the other side. Black has to do a dual task of trying to stop that idea, meanwhile being conscientious of the fact that Capablanca might do a switch around. c5, king h5, doing the plan that I just mentioned. Knight e6, king h6, knight f8. Oh, not knight f8. In that case, bishop f5 would be very uncomfortable. 
Of course, that's why he played the king f8, that is Corzo. Because in that case, this knight would be dominated, and it's very difficult to deal with the g6, g7 idea. Um, this is actually one of those formations you want to avoid at all costs when you're playing with the knight. King f8, bishop f5, knight g7, bishop c8. But Capablanca does the same thing. Again, this knight is basically stalemated. Even if you go knight e8, there is this idea of g6. If you go here, then there's this nice move of king h7 and g7. Uh, g8 is a big threat. It doesn't even matter. You can't take the bishop because of that. And if you go here, I can capture the pawn. And that should be a winning game for white. So bishop c8, b6, g6. And this is kind of the reason why modern players love the bishops more than the knight because the bishop is very comfortable switching sides. This knight has a difficult time going to the other side and actually become useful. So here the big plan for white should be to do a sudden switch and in that case these pawns will fall victim for the king's attack as this knight is not ready to block the g-pawn and help out with the defense on the queen side. d4, b3. Not the uh, move that you would want to play if you look at the color of the bishop because you would rather have it on the black squares. However, here this one has a function of controlling the c4 and d3 squares. King g8, a4. So White is sort of building this hedgehog formation, just spiking up the d3, c4, b5 squares, so there is no way of creating a pass pawn. Black's goal would be, by the way, to create a passer. So if white goes king g5, c4, try to exchange as many pawns as possible, give up this knight for the g pawn, and hope that there are not enough pawns left on the board. Now it's much more difficult to do, and also the color of this a2 pawn is identical to the color of that bishop on c8, which kind of increases Capablanca's chances of winning anyways. Because it's the right color, even if white is left with the a pawn, it's still a win. So b3, king g8, a4, the main concept, stopping any pawn moves, this bishop is already taken away, this idea of a6, king f8. You can see that black is just going back and forth, back and forth. Bishop g4, knight e8, king here, king here, king h6, knight e8, bishop e2. Just turn it around and improving his pieces. He decides that this bishop on c8 might run into some tactical ideas later. It's better to stop any advances from e2 where the bishop is from a comfortable distance and it doesn't really have to worry about any attacks. Knight g7, bishop c4, knight e8. And once Capablanca found the ideal spot for the bishop, he ventures and goes for the king walk. Not before that, he made sure that everything's in order. And this is actually a sign of great talent. He has the patience to maneuver around his bishop until he finds the right spot. And then he continues on with the decisive maneuver. Now, of course, Capablanca could have gone for the attack, this king g5, king f5, king e5, and attacking, well, to be more exact, g5, f5, e5 here and this way. Um, he could have done that earlier, but just out of prophylaxis, so just out of safety, he made sure that this bishop and all these pawns are defended, and that's the moment he strikes, just like Carlsen in modern times. King g5, king e7, king f5, and now again, here comes the big problem for black. The king will still need to be around the g-pawn, because if white ever manages to push it to g7 successfully, it's a win. However, if your knight moves there, then you're basically down a piece on this side of the board. Oh, let me do that arrow once more. That's it. Knight h5, bishop e2. Again, telling that knight to go back. 
If you go a knight g3, there is bishop f3 and this knight is cut off. Can never go back. The two entry squares towards g7 are locked. Knight g7, king d5, knight d8, king c6. King is making a walk towards the finish line. Knight g7, king b7, king d6, king takes a7, king c7. Now, full credit for Corzo for coming up with this creative idea of giving up the pawn just to lock in this king. This actually is very typical in many endgames, and it is a useful pattern to remember. You can give up a pawn just to sort of close in that king and get this side opposition. However, white still has stronger pieces and a way to get the king out. So it will not help Corzo too much, but it is still a nice try by the black player. Here, knight e8, bishop f3. Here, bishop d5, knight e8, bishop f7. Here, the king eventually gets out of that corner, and that kind of is the beginning of the end. And he's going to undermine the b pawn with a5, and then the c and d pawn falls. So in a couple of moves, he's winning. Knight f5, a5, knight d6, king a6, takes. And now the knight has wandered off too long, and g7 wins the game. So quite a nice game by Capablanca. Not that he had the advantage from the start, but gradually he created enough targets and weaknesses in Corzo's position so he could win it. Quite astounding play, honestly. So the next game I want to show is played between Capablanca and Horowitz, um, where, again, you'll see how he uses those ideas of actually using the structural advantage of a position. So every endgame starts from an opening. And here you'll see how he uses these structural weaknesses in Horowitz's position. So let's have a look. So in this game, Capablanca goes for the Reiti setup. Uh, Richard Reiti, who was a fantastic, fantastic and innovative player, one of the first hypermodern players out there. He liked experimenting with knight f3, g3 ideas, or both g3 and b3. Now, in this game, you're going to see Capablanca do the same thing. Bishop b2, bishop f5, d3, e6, knight d2. So here, white is sort of building a little bit of a hat, but it is actually very spiky. He puts pressure on d5 and hopes to break it open with e4 later on. Now, not yet, because the king is still in the middle, but that is his plan in the future. Bishop d6, g3, castles, bishop g2, knight d7, castles, queen e7, rook e1, e5, takes, takes, rook c1. So, we're still in the middle game, but there is one more thing that I want to point out here before we head straight to the end game. These pawns are loose, and we could also call them somewhat hanging, because there's no support behind those pawns, and that'll actually be the reason why Capablanca, why Capablanca is going to get some winning chances. Rook d8 here, h6. So the couple of moves played here are not that interesting should be 6 but this is the moment where it really gets interesting. So it seems very normal for Horowitz playing black, but now Capablanca is going to meticulously put pressure on the D and E pawns, queen a1. Now this looks a little bit weird at the first sight, but actually it does put a lot of pressure on the E pawn and Horowitz actually obliges plays D4. But that again has one issue with it. The B pawn is going to become a target. Rook e c1. And this is actually a nice thing, and I wanted to show this part as well, because Capablanca is also a fantastic tactician. 
It's not emphasized too much, but here, this is a tactical trick. There's no d takes e3 because of rook takes c8 and uh, Capablanca is up the exchange. So actually with this tricky move order with rook e c1, he is gaining time. Rook takes c2, knight takes c2, queen d6, e3. It's just undermining this e and d pawns and creating a weakness. d takes, knight takes c3, knight g4, takes, takes, queen c3, rook e8, knight e1, b6. So this is the position that I wanted to reach. Um, seemingly, it's very even. But compared to black's pieces, white is much, much more organized. The knight is defending the only weakness that Capablanca has, and the bishop is just stronger than its counterpart on g4, which kind of strikes into nothingness. Like there's nothing to be targeted over here, and there's no more e2 pawn to really attack. Also, the knight and bishop Apart from, like, the bishop is not really good, but the knight at least is defending the pawn. So clearly here in this position, Horvitz's best piece is the queen, and the first thing that Capablanca does is to exchange it off. Queen c6, queen takes c6, rook takes c6. Now there is the rule when we talk about weaknesses of two, two, like two weaknesses in a position. Here, there's plenty of weaknesses in black's position, so why should be able to get ample winning chances? One of the weaknesses here is the a-pawn and the e5-pawn. Now, the e5-pawn is harder to get to, so there'll still be a lot of fight for that square. That pawn is well defended, however, the a-pawn is weak and it is less likely, uh, like the a-pawn is less likely to, to be defended well enough. Rook d8, rook c7. Again, immediately going after the weakest link. a5, there's really no other way. Bishop d5. So, we started off with the position with sort of a slight advantage for Capablanca, but you can feel the pressure right now, and the advantage is sort of growing. Now white has a, knight, a rook on the seventh. There is a rook on the seventh. There's some threats on the f7 square, and this bishop now is sort of tying di down that knight. You can't move that knight because the f7 pawn would fall. So that means that Horowitz needs to untangle very quickly, unless he's giving up. King f8, f3 just making sure there's no bishop e2, bishop f5, bishop c4. Now, this might strike you as something new and uh, different, but if you just recall the previous game where Capablanca faced Corzo in that very symmetrical and dry end game, he makes sure that all of his pieces are well coordinated and that they're ready to sort of take the second step. Bishop c4 is that kind of move. He's not getting into the action until he's sure that his pawns are defended. Still knight c5 wouldn't work. This f7 pawn needs a defense. Now, bishop c4 is a good move because it keeps Horovitz guessing and gives Horovitz the option to go astray. There's plenty of ways of playing this position. You could go bishop g6, you could go f6. Now if you go bishop g6, your bishop would be off sides and not really participating in the defense anymore. If you go f6 instead, you are sort of creating targets over e7, f7, and g7, and the king will be cut off. So with this bishop c4, not only did he strengthen his situation, but he also kind of gave an opportunity for black to go wrong. King e7, bishop b5. Slowly, slowly strengthening the grip and put, putting pressure on that knight. Bishop e6, knight g2. 
Now, Capablanca realized the rook is ideal on the C file. It's much better than this rook, which has no pressure and no say on that file. The bishop is pressing this knight. What's not playing? Well, it's clearly the knight on e1. So if possible, he'd like to activate it via knight e1, knight e1, knight g2, knight e3, and knight c4, going after these two weaknesses. These two weaknesses, which makes this quite a good plan. So it goes knight g2. This is the plan. This is the big plan. And now Horowitz is in trouble. Rook b8, knight e3. Knight is heading towards c4. King d8, and rook a7. And I really love this move of rook a7. It sort of, sort of says, hey, I've already got the control on the 7th rank. I should be doing quite well here. I'm not going to leave the seventh rank unless you work hard to get me out of there. And just notice, even if black plays a random move, now knight c4 would show up on the board and you can't even take because there's rook d7 here and b takes c4 winning the piece and probably the game. Why is this such a bad news? Well, if white's next move, which is quite a simple move, is that strong, that means that black is just in deep, deep trouble. Rook c8, knight c4, rook c7. So Horowitz is desperately trying to get rid of that rook. But will Capablanca oblige? No, he's not going to exchange it off. In fact, goes rook a6, which does look a little bit bizarre. But he's saying that the b-pawn is just too weak, and eventually, after some takes on d7, it'll fall. So black is forced to take, d takes, and now there is still this big threat of taking, and rook takes a b6. However, there is another rule of thumb to follow when you get a good position, and probably Capablanca was familiar with that. Anytime you start exchanging to win material, you're sort of loosening your grip of the position. If white after king c8 would take on d7, then he'd give up his very, very strong bishop on b5 for a terrible knight that was basically condemned to defend this square. And after rook takes, there's this check, or even rook d2, giving and getting some counterplay for that pawn. Now, does this necessarily mean this is not an option for Capablanca? Not at all. I mean, this could be played as well, but it's definitely inferior to the move of rook a8 check, saying, hey, your knight is so bad, I'd like you to have it. And once you sort of exchanged off your powerful bishop, on e6 to my knight. Now I think my job is done. I don't need my rook on a6 no more. That's what, that was the only reason I had it there. And now I'm going to look for greener pastures. King b7, rook g8, g6, rook e8. Again, Capablanca is in no rush to hunt down pawns. He is not trying to go, for example, with g4 and win this h pawn. What he doesn't want to do is give Horowitz the momentum to untangle. g4 could potentially give him a moment to untangle, maybe something like knight f6 here and e4. Not necessarily saving the game, but actually giving a bit of hope because this knight from a terrible square got to f6 and actually has some threats, which he didn't have before. So that makes rook e8 such a strong move here because it says, no, I don't really care about winning material as long as your pieces cannot move. So it's not even just going to pursue them. And 
Horvitz's next move is basically just going to admit that, yeah, you're right, I can't do anything, and I'd rather give up a pawn for free, just let me go, just make, make, make me live a better life than that. If f6, by the way, over defending, there's rook e6, and after bishop d7, Capablanca's rook will go full Pac-Man on the f6, g6, and h6 pawns which is completely hopeless, of course, for the black player. Rook e8, so Horowitz decides to go knight c5, rook takes e5. And in this sense, Capablanca was right. Pressure helped him win the position because he didn't need to go after those pawns. Now, the next move for uh, Horowitz is still kind of a desperation, but it's important to see how Capablanca wins this position even when it is, quote-unquote, completely winning. Completely winning because he's up a pawn and has much better pieces. Bishop e8, again, pestering those pawns on f7 and g6. Here, bishop b5, back. You might be wondering, okay, so does Capablanca have no idea what's going on? No, he knows what's going on, but he is in no hurry of A, showing his intentions, B, kind of feel or show that he's nervous at all. He just actually repeats, and I'm going to show that again, he repeats the position just to show dominance. And this is the psychological part of chess. He kind of repeats the position saying, there is so much potential in my game that I can repeat anytime I'd like and you will have to uh, oblige. And now he goes king f2 after he gained time. I mean, he, they played a couple of moves. Um, and now this is actually winning. And, you know, he has the winning position plus the psychological advantage. Like he milks everything that he can in this game of chess. King c8, f4. So he's trying to go f5, creating more targets. King d8, king e3. Yet he's no, in no rush. So he brings up his king, puts these pawns on dark squares, which is what you should do if you have a white squared bishop. King e7, rook d5. So yet again, Capablanca is going for domination. He is not trying to force the win. So he's not trying to find like an easy way to end the game quickly. He just enjoys the pressure and slowly, slowly outplays Horowitz. F5. And of course, he had an idea in mind. If he wouldn't have had a different idea in mind, he probably would have played something like F5 and this should be winning as well. But he decides that, hey, I do not need to play on the side where each of us have three, three pawns. I could just play on the side where I have a majority and an extra pawn. So he goes for a3, goes for this b4 idea, knight c5, b4, takes, takes, knight e6, rook d3. Why did... Capablanca go rook d3. Well, the rook has done its job. There's no way of getting this rook on the default, so this rook is not a big danger, but you have to look for a new target, and that new target is on b6. So he's going for that with this maneuver, or at least hinting at it. Rook a7, not allowing this maneuver, rook a3, rook a6, h4. Note that just like in the previous game, he tries to make sure that these pawns stay on white squares. And Horowitz plays this move of h5, which is very dangerous, because if this bishop ever gets behind them, he's just going to pick up all those pawns. Bishop c6, just activating the bishop, preparing to exchange the bishop for the knight as well. If that exchange happens, is a technically winning endgame. Rook c7, bishop d5, and seeing that um, 
Bishop takes e6 is threatened, he goes for knight f8. King d4, this is an endgame, so you bring in your king, as Capablanca does so with king f2, king e3, and king d4. King d6, rook a3, finally he gets his maneuver in, and that is sort of the beginning of the end in this game. And what we've seen from almost the middle game, once he played queen c6, he never really let go. All through from that moment, he had the control of the game and had the control of the most important squares. Now this bishop is dominating this knight on f8, this rook is dominating this rook, and after this move, there'll be c5 break happening with all these pawns probably falling to that rook's attack. So here now, Horowitz is collapsing, goes for knight e6, and surprisingly enough, like I, even I would be tempted to capture this knight, but he says, no, this bishop on d5 is just too strong. I'm not going to give that to you. Um, probably that is also easily winning. But he says, no, I make a statement. I have a good piece. Your piece is much worse than mine. Not exchanging it. King d3, knight f8, rook a8. And this is actually a wonderful game by Capablanca here. Horowitz resigned, rightfully so, because eventually he's just going to run out of moves or run out of pawns. So I'm really happy that I could show you this game where Capablanca sort of said, I prefer real uh, competent pieces and strong piece play instead of material. So I hope that you enjoyed this lecture on domination in the endgames and how to win an even endgame. That can only Capablanca do. Thank you so much. Have a good night.